everyone. So uh, my name is Ben. I'm uh, a freelance software developer living here in Berlin. Um, I do open source. I do this and decentralized uh, web stuff. Um, hashtag all my hashtags. Uh, you can learn more about me and do it more your work or uh, follow me on Twitter if you come back. But we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about the impending doom of civil society and how we fought for horses. You know, something like the today. Um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, let me paint a little picture first. Um, imagine a world in which um, the, the world's knowledge is at your fingertips. With a device smaller than your hand that fits into your pocket, you can access the entire world's knowledge anywhere and, and at any time. And you can connect to anyone on Earth um, through sending messages, um, sending pictures, videos, Heck, you can even live stream your protest to the world. All of that backed by an infrastructure, a communication system so all-compassing and, and important that other infrastructure is based on it and uses it for its own communication as well, like the data grid or cars. Now imagine that everything you do on this network is constantly tracked. Everything you look at is recorded. Everything you share with someone else, everything you write down is written down and looked at by governments and corporations alike. And that little device that you have in your pocket as well as other devices that you use for your convenience are actually tracking you in real life too, on top of it. And within the system, this little amount of privacy that you have left, you have to voluntarily trade in to gain access to the system in the first place. So in order to be able to share the picture with your mom, you actually have to upload it into that cloud. Despite the fact that this system is really bad at keeping that data secure. <coughs> like seriously bad. Um, I, I shared the slide just before Twitter. I recommend you look at this. The information is beautiful on that has a uh, great graph of the data, which is dating back all the way, all the way to 1994. Um, and it's really scary. And this doesn't even include the fuck up just, that just happened with, with Cloudflare that we learned about yesterday. Sorry. Now imagine that this entire uh, data is not only tracked, but it's actually used against you. And you know it. Now let's imagine that this surveillance system that is in place and is so all-compassing that you just have to accept its existence would be under the control of a, a demagogue or a racist or a fascist. Now, I don't have to tell you in this room today that what I just described is not some Orwellian uh, dystopian world. This is the internet today. What you just looked at are Headlines of the last three to five years. This is Internet February 2017. That's the state. But that's not the internet that I signed up for. That's not the internet that I fought for, that we fought for when we wanted a free internet. Um, so what are we going to do with that? Well, first we have to be facing some really hard truths and um, some things that we don't like. We have to actually dig deeper into what is the root problem that we're facing here. And when I say root problem, very often the conversation about this kind of issue that I just described is very much on the surface. It discusses that there should be a surveillance state, and I agree. And companies that do have privacy relevant information need to be better at securing it. And I agree with that too. But we, as the developers and, and engineers behind this, have to ask ourselves the really tough question of how is that even possible? Why is that something that could happen in the first place? And we have to admit that this is because of our way of data warehousing, by centralizing access to data in the general scheme. And we know this. We know that the more decentralized the network, the more resilient and the harder to crack and overtake it is. And we have been implementing a very variety of systems in the internet to certain um, varying degrees of decentralization. Um, email as, as one example of a, of a distributed, of a 
federated system that you cannot take down. And getting into Gmail does not give you access to all the emails. And that's an important property. But if we think of the way that we also design our data systems today and the way we do our data warehousing, we have to admit we're nowhere close to the tone, the tone style systems. We are, if you have PostgreSQL in a cluster in your backend, you're maximum step two. Um, but more important than, than just thinking of this as physical distribution, when we say decentralization, we mean the division of power. We mean splitting things up into smaller chunks that cannot be accessed that easily. So when we when we talk about data warehousing in, in this kind of model, we're not saying that this is a computer and this is a computer and this is a computer, if all of them have access to everything all the time. What we mean here is that this is a person and this is a person and they have their own data and they choose who and what to share with others in this network. Now this sounds like the utopian world, doing a, a peer to peer network like this, and I agree. Um, it's still theoretical to some sense, but the, the project that I'm involved in, the same network, the, the open source project, we aim to build exactly that. We aim to build a decentralized, privacy first, open source data storage and communication network that provides a secure, efficient, and no cost infrastructure for our network. Um, in, in simple terms, this means it's a peer-to-peer -peer storage mechanism. Similar to BitTorrent, but it has a functionality built in that makes sure that when you store something on the network, it's always going to be available, even if that particular node that currently holds it is going to go <coughs> And when we say privacy first, we, we want to build this into this network. <coughs> Which means that whatever data leaves your computer should be encrypted by default. Not the other way around, that some stuff is encrypted. Everything should be encrypted by default. Unless the app explicitly tells us that this particular data should not be encrypted for a specific purpose, everything is going to be encrypted. Um, as a network of data storage, we of course want to have and do have a deduplication of the network. So we're not storing the same data twice. We're not storing um, the same movie twice in the network, for example. Because it's wasting a lot of resources. Another aspect um, that this uh, system has is it has a self-authentication and registration mechanism. Meaning that when I say privacy first, I mean it in exactly the way that I don't want to know, want to have to know that you're using it. You shouldn't have to come to me, to the company that is building most of it, or any other third party in order to gain access to it. The self-authentication mechanism allows you to connect to the network and interact with it directly without any third party involvement. And last but not least, as I mentioned before, we're building this as an infrastructure, not just a network, a peer-to-peer -peer network. We have built many of those before. Um, but an infrastructure to build apps on top of apps that are distributed themselves and that use this distributed and decentralized um, data in order to do their job. Because for the lack of a better word, I usually say the word decentralized to combine that with those <laughs> things. Um, this project has been in the works for 11 years now. The company just celebrated its 11th birthday uh, two days ago. Um, and, um, Anybody who has ever tried to build a stable peer-to-peer -peer network knows that there's a lot of things involved and this is not a really easy thing to do. So uh, just within our system we have a bunch of features. And each one of these bubbles that you see here has a white paper that you can look up in our RFC repo um, and is worth a 45 minute talk by itself, but I don't have time for that. Um, instead what I would like to talk about today is what this means from a data usage perspective. So when you look of, when we think of the safe network, we can think of a peer-to-peer -peer storage mechanism that has some way of uh, defining responsibility for a piece of data within this network and find consensus around this. And that doesn't only apply to data, this also applies to any type of process. So you can, you can model multi-step processes with these networks that are untrusted because you have enough of them that are randomly assigned, predictably randomly 
being assigned um, in order to ensure that the other ones are acting in the expected manner as well. Um, as mentioned before, I don't have time to talk about this in depth. If you're interested in this consensus mechanism, I recommend the uh, talk I just gave at Boston uh, two weeks ago, where I go into depth into exactly that. For us today, what all we care about is, is a global key value store. We have a key, a number that is in the SHA-256 uh, realm, size of numbers, so really big. And behind that, asking the network for it, we find some value. Depending, um, secondly, this network contains the information of a type tag. Depending on <coughs> which type tag you have the network for, it provides you different data. It expects the data that is stored there to be in different formats. But, and depending on these formats, this allows, it allows different activities to be happening on this. Coming back to the set indication mechanism from before, that if I know where to find it, and I say I want this um, authentication mechanism, I won't get it from the network directly. I have to provide a pin. With that pin, these nodes in the network decrypt this information. If they can, they send this decrypted information back. But again, nothing should be leaving unencrypted our, our own computer. Um, this account information itself is still not enough. You still need a second password that you only use on the client side in order to decrypt the actual file of the key, as well as some, <coughs> as well as some um, session information. Or another data type of reusable data or immutable. So with this system, we can define multiple data types. I mentioned here authentication, uh, mutable data, and mutable data, and we're going to look into that in a minute. Um, but we can also think of new data types, like can we model currency with this? Can we define a specific key that represents a coin and have this have an activity on it that allows the transfer of that coin. So after the transfer is over, you wouldn't actually know where it came from. You wouldn't have to have a ledger of all of the coins existing. But that's as far as I go today, at least because that's still very good. Um, instead, I'd like to talk about immutable data. Immutable data is defined as a piece of a chunk of data that, um, in order to store it, needs to be stored at the SHA sum at of the address needs to be the SHA sum of its content. So a very simple mechanism to ensure that at a specific address, I find a specific content. Um, this idea is called content addressing uh, in comparison to what we, how we usually, how, how commonly address things right now to a somewhat physical location at some point, an IP, and then where it, on that IP something is. Um, content addressing uh, gives you an identifier to find an object no matter its physical location. Um, <coughs> you, you might have seen these kind of uh, URLs before. Because they're actually existing already for over 10 years, uh, magnet links are part of how you find things in Bitcoin um, if you don't want to use trackers. Another nice uh, property this gives us is deduplication. I mentioned that before. By saying um, we use the sum of its content, it also means that the same person trying to store the same data again would come up with the same uh, address that it wants to store it, and the network would be like, yeah, I already have this. Very nice and easy way to make sure that any piece of data that only exists once. Right. Well, except for, if we now take the common use case, I want to share a picture with my mom or with my dad. If I don't want everybody where I store this data to just look at their hard drive and, and find my picture, it could be any for you, I don't really want this, <coughs> I would have to encrypt it. I would encrypt it with my dad's private public key and my mom's public key, making it two different sets of data again. That is not really what we want. From a network's perspective, this is, as far as um, any node is concerned, anything that it does. But when I say we're, we're talking about an infrastructure here, we, we have more things built into the libraries on the client side that help you do certain things in a better manner, transparently. One of these is self-encryption, and that comes into play here. Um, <coughs> this is actually an independent project. You can use that independently of the, um, of, uh, the, the network itself. It's just an app that, uh, when you click on that link, I really recommend you do that, 
uh, gives you this really easy graph explaining you what's going on. Um, in, if you So it gives you this really nice graph explaining you how, how what's going on in self-approach. But in essence what it does is it takes a file, takes a piece of file, any uh, piece of data, it splits it into smaller chunks, and then uses each one of those chunks to group it with one another. And out of that comes a new chunk that is then some garbage. <coughs> um, and we do that with all of the chunks that we have. Now we have a bunch of gobbled chunks that are encrypted. So we can easily store them with a mutual data on the network. Anybody looking at this piece of data won't have any information that anyone <coughs> to see there. The important thing about self-encryption is that this is a process that can be, can, be, can be reversed if you just know which pieces of data you want to put together in what order. We call that the data map. And with this little information of take these addresses, take them in this order, and you can get back to your original file, we can store these chunks of data. We can even store this entire same information because we're using the same algorithm and we always come up with the same chunks um, to store this picture on the network. And all the, the only thing we have to actually encrypt and share with the other participants in this case, my mom and my dad, is an encrypted version of the data map, which is much, much smaller. So, Immutable data, um, as the network is concerned, and self encryption on top, and this is something transparent for the application, it just says, hey, I'm storing this, I want to store this information on the network, um, means we can store encrypted public and private um, content that is deduplicated. So if I, uh, if I would upload the same movie and you upload the same movie, it would end up with the same chunks. Um, and we can still content address it. However, useful data has one particular main effect, it's immutable. So while this works well for that particular picture that I want to share with my mom, it doesn't really work well for the list of pictures that I have, because that is constantly changing. So of course we also have a mutable data object. Well that's taking the hat a little bit. This is what we're currently implementing. We have an old version. We're going to see the new version. Um, that is, uh, is in, a sen in essence, defined as that. Um, this is excuse that. Um, so this is this is a Rust struct definition. If you're you know, too familiar with it, the thing that you care about most is this data part. Um, and if, if you're familiar with with the same wording here, we quickly realize um, what this means is the mutable data is basically a hash map. It has keys that have values in it. Um, and uh, it has an address again, and uh, it needs a, a contact, the tag type, in order to be able to force to find it. But then we can manipulate a hash map of things. In our case of, of file names, if you have ever tried to do a file hierarchy in AWS uh, E3 buckets, um, S3 buckets, you know, we just take the path, the full path as, as the key, and then we store, in our case, the data map as the value, um, and then we just emulate the hierarchy of, of files and values. Nobody really cares if that is that's actually focus anymore. But then we violate law number one again. We should not decrypt anything on the network. So, uh, we should not leave anything out of the system that is in the network. So, how do we make it private? I think it's the pattern here. We use crypto, of course. Make sure I'm um, similarly, as the data map for immutable data, we have a mutable data info object that we keep out of sync of, uh, out of the system um, that stores the mutable data itself. And in here, we're going to have the, the 
the address of the tag, this is how we find um, this particular piece of data in the network. And then we have this optional encryption info. It can contain a symmetric key, meaning that um, with this symmetric key, each key and each value in the um, and the original data is actually encrypted. And if you're familiar with encryption a little bit, you know that you should never encrypt something without using nonce. I don't know what we use nonce in order to make sure that somebody finding a cipher text and knowing what it meant could go through the list of other cipher texts and find out what other things mean. So for that, um, so if we so the system we're using Lipsodium enforces that by itself that we use nonce in there, which is really good. But that also means for us that we can't use lookups anymore, which is a very useful feature on a key value store that we can look up for a key. We would have to go through the list of all of the keys, look up the nonces, and calculate whether that's our key. Um, so optionally as well, we have in there a mutual data wide nonce, a number of used ones to calculate for the keys, not for the values. Um, which allows us to do lookups as well, if that is uh, a necessary feature. So again, um, we can store this data, the data in the network as mutable data. We can retrieve it from the network. It's just strange to the clients that we care if it's cipher text or not. And on the on the actual client side, where we have this information of how to understand this information, decrypt it, um, even transparently to the app itself, which is pretty damn nice. This data map allows us to share access as well. You might have noticed before that I didn't talk about the lower part of this in there, but there's a, there's a set of owners as well. Whenever you create a mutable data on the network, actually any um, request you do on the network that means mutation is happening, you need to sign with your public key. And so when you create a mutable data object, you become the owner by storing your your public key in this data set. And the network enforces that a certain amount of activities can only be done by owners. For example, deleting this particular object. If somebody tries to send a delete request <coughs> to uh, a mutual data that they don't have the ownership for, they can't. The system's going to deny that. Similarly, every app that you have um, that, require, that wants to access the network gets their own public key. And we can use a permission field over here to define which activities are allowed on the data itself within the system. That is just a map of either public key or the any one flag. Going to a list of activities that can or can't be done. So with this, you can, for example, create a mutable data where you say anybody or anyone can insert. Or this particular app can update. Again, to recap, mutual data, which is the, the actual thing that the network provides in combination with what happens internally in the library, um, allows us to have encrypted uh, public and private hash maps with shared access. Pretty awesome. But what does that actually mean? How does it actually work? Um, let's take a look at an example of the default containers. Default containers is a list of containers that we create when we sign up with the network. Um, just to store some information and give access to those apps to that. Um, we create a, a private random mutual data on the network, so a random address that we just pick up, um, with a, a data info that has encryption key in there, that we also randomly create. And then we have in it a list of, of different keys that are transparently encrypted on the network. I don't even know what they look like, um, but to me, they look like this. Um, and each one of them points again to the serialized version of another private um, private uh, mutual data that is somewhere sort of in the network that you then can access in order to look at this. Um, all of this information, like the, the basic, how, where to find this object and how to access it with the private key and public key is stored in your session token, um, so you can access that whenever you sign up with the system. Now, if you have an app that wants to, for example, get the access to pictures, um, 
uh, folder or container, I would call it, um, they would go to you and say, hey, I'd like to have the following access to this pictures container. Um, for example, this could be a, uh, a picture app that just wants to add pictures to the container. What you do is you look at this part of the MDAT info, you go to the actual MDAT on the network, and add for this app's key the um, insert accessibility. Then you take this serialized um, private, da private data that contains the information on how to read and write on this, uh, on this particular MDAT itself and give that back to the app. From now on, the app can, independently of you or any other sort of body, directly connect to the network and insert properly to this particular MDAT. But it cannot delete or update. And if you think about that, this, this, this split on, on this particular feature of insert with this update is a very common one which we, which we can use to enforce a lot of things that users actually want. I want my phone to be able to put more pictures in it, I want it to uh, add thumbnails, I want it to even like, make another version that contains uh, some nice filter on top. But it doesn't mean that I want the same app to have the access rights to delete or update other pictures. It's a shift. It's not the use case. But I might have an app that is actually organizing all of that for me so that they are on my run to do this. Another example would be public names. The idea here is that you want to provide a browsing-like experience where you have a domain name, and we use that domain name to do a lookup on the network for some files, essentially, in XHTML, some CSS files to render these nice things. Um, and in essence, you have a um, you, you take this domain name, and make a sharp 256, some part of that, and you get a specific address in the network. And there you expect a service container, a list of services like www, email, whatever service this domain provides, um, with some information on how to access the service. So this is uh, what the UI looks, the UI looks like when it actually uploads this information for you, and then you can browse it. Um, in, a, in, a, in a code perspective, this looks like this. So this is one of the layers we provide is a JavaScript uh, layer that is also available in the, in the um, browser itself. Um, it uses promises and it's using ES6, so it looks a little complicated and a little big, but let me walk you right through it. It's quite simple actually. What we do here is we create a new private container. This is where we want to store our service lists, uh, our, our actual data within that service. Um, <coughs> we then use this service and um, over here, the, uh, yeah. um, the NFS part, this is what I meant with, we have stocked away the immutable data for you. If you just give us the content and say, I want to store this as a file type thingy on the network, then what you get back is, is a file object that you can serialize. And although this is a new random private container, so it contains its own symmetric key and its own nuns, we just reference and index HTML. This is what we want to here. Once we have done this, we generate the domain name that we want to have and create a new uh, new public data. So in this particular case, we really want it to be public because anybody is supposed to do it just by knowing this name. Um, then we take our service mutual data information, we serialize that, and we store that inside of the key www. Um, in order for someone else to find the WWW series service, um, even though this is a private, technically a private information. So whoever is, whoever is storing it doesn't know that there's files in there and what they look like. <coughs> you can use the same mechanism to also, um, I mentioned that before, the browser exposes the same JavaScript API to provide comments on the blog. You could say that this URL I take the shell sum of that and I expect there to be a mutual data object that is just a list of comments. And you can take that even a step further. You could say rather than this becoming a list of comments, the value could actually be the, the link to another mutual data 
and this other mutable data would then be the actual comment, or in the deforum case, which is a decentralized forum, um, the, the actual post, which is then owned by whoever actually created it. And the only thing that is in the other and accessible to the moderator of the forum would be the link to that thing. But the post is yours. You wrote it. Nobody can delete it out there, only you can. And that's guaranteed by them. Another example would be safe emailing. Um, we have quite a public key infrastructure in it, so that's, that's not this case. I'm going to speed up a little bit so we can get through this. So why am I talking about all of that? Why am I talking about all of that? Such a thing. I think the urgency and why I think this is important got clear from the beginning. I hope so. Um, but I wouldn't have to go into such depth um, to, to get, uh, get this point across. But there's, 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 there's another thing I'd like to um, convey to you, and that is crypto is your friend. Us developers have been scared of and off, uh, away from crypto for very long with the only on crypto kind of things, which also meant we've not really embraced it. We, like, it the symptomatic version of that is the password function in various database tools. That is just like there on top. But what we just looked at were two really boring and simple data types, the mutable data itself, the network where the mutable data is just a hash map. That by adding encryption to this entire thing became a completely new thing with amazing new properties. So if you take just one thing away from this today, it is the the that A, crypto is necessary. If you have any privacy relevant information that anybody else cares about, the NSA is sooner or later getting into your system. This is not questioning. So physical access is not gonna protect anyone at all. Um, so you should embrace crypto. And when you build data and you structure the next data, you might wanna think about how you can even embrace and take features that crypto delivers into the system to build new things. The second thing is that most of us are in our team are actually more on the network side of things. So there's, uh, we're not that experienced in building big data structures and that kind of stuff. And, but this is a really different way of approaching many of these problems. And so we have open questions too. Like, how would you build the search index? Can you build the search index? What would that look like? Or can you build a social graph? that does not require everyone to tell everyone else who they like and they don't like. And last but not least, what other types of data could there be that we should talk about and think about, like currency being one, but with a global namespace, we could potentially think of more new use cases. And last but not least, I want to contribute to find the resistance. Um, not necessarily our project, there's other projects that were building similar things. There's Ethereum Swarm, for example, or, um, or uh, IPDB, who are also intending to build a global namespace for document storage. Um, and we need more people that, that help us think about what and how we structure data within that. Um, or, at the very least, you can run your own dirt of the system, which is called Bold Science. Um, and last, if, if you're very, if you're interested in what that means to how and what that means and how to build applications on top of this, I'm currently writing an ebook which on exactly that topic. Um, looking for contributions. Um, I hope to have the first iteration finished that is looking at this and um, other and other um, platforms that I just mentioned to build first a normal, simple thing like a comment on a blog but later to actually build like social networks and how, how we would want to know this information. With that, I'd like to remind you my name is Ben. Um, you can find me online right there there. Um, this is a Stormtrooper. You can <coughs> every slide that you have a Stormtrooper. Um, <laughs> the particular project I'm involved in has a bunch of links that you can get more information with. And with that, I'd like to say thank you.
in your diagram. Um, what if I'm your ISP and I'm monitoring your outgoing connection? Then I see the order uh, that things are going out. So We're not sending them in order? Okay. Then That's the first thing. And we randomize that. And secondly, the connection between two nodes is also identical okay. between the two nodes. That's good to know. Uh, a second question, if I may, um, how do you defend against still things? Like if I'm, I have many resources and I can create <coughs> a lot of fake identities, and then I have. Um, I'm controlling a lot of the ID space in the sharp devices. And like not every, uh, I mean not every um, number is, is like controlled, so you know it's actually controlling several numbers and the not join. So um, I have a high chance of getting a lot of the network data and why can't I just take it offline to mess with network? Okay, so the question is what do you do about civil attacks? Can I just take enough resources and, and take over a specific parts of the network? Um, so there has been um, I, I want to refer to the other talk again because this gets more into depth into the consensus, uh, consensus system there. Um, there have been some mathematical models on how many um, copies you want to have in the network that even a like a net split of the size of a sort of layer would not take your data down. Um, it's supposed to be five. We're currently running at eight, um, which sometimes goes to up to sixteen depending on, on how the network is splitting up. Um, so this is about just taking data down. Um, could you potentially um, take over the responsibility of specific data by just having all of the nodes uh, connected to it properly? Um, that is a theoretical attack window, but for that you would need to know the entire state of the entire network and all other node names that are around. Um, in order to know which ones are the closest in that particular case, which ones are on the opposite side of that, and not even we, with the current machine that we have, know how many nodes are going to run. So, um, while it's theoretically possible, we don't see it as achievable mm -hmm. in the current terms of it. Any other questions? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Thank you, Ben. So, um, kind of, kind of the end.